Without a doubt, Rubik's Cube has been the most successful physical puzzle ever invented. But in the last 10 years, the world's most popular puzzle, requiring less physical dexterity and more logical reasoning, is Sudoku. Here's a typical Sudoku puzzle. Part of Sudoku's enduring popularity is that the challenge can be described in a single sentence. Enter the numbers 1 through 9 in such a way that each number appears once in every row, column, and 3x3 three three box. That's it! Every Sudoku puzzle will have a unique solution, and if the puzzle is well-crafted, should be solvable using just pure logic. No guessing should be required. Is Sudoku a mathematical game? Absolutely. And it's not because the grid is filled with numbers. It would be just as mathematical if each square had to be filled with a letter or a color or one of nine vegetables. What makes Sudoku mathematical is that in order to solve it, you need to think like a mathematician by looking for patterns and using careful logic. I think Sudoku is great mathematical training for kids, and for adults it's a fun way to keep your mind active and sharp. I'm definitely a big fan of this puzzle. Now before I teach you a good strategy for solving Sudoku, let me say a few words about some of the mathematical questions that pertain to this puzzle. With the Rubik's Cube, we asked how many positions are possible, and what's the fewest number of moves needed to solve them. Let's look at some related questions here, starting with how many different Sudoku puzzles are there? Now, as a warm-up question, let's first count the number of baby Sudoku puzzles, sometimes referred to as Shidoku. In Shidoku, you must fill out a 4x4 four four grid with the numbers 1 through 4 in such a way that every number appears in each row, column, and 2x2 two two box. For example, here's a typical Shidoku puzzle. These problems tend to be very easy to solve. For instance, here, once you notice that a 2 has to go here, and a 3 has to go here, then the puzzle pretty much solves itself at that point, resulting in this completed grid. The math question is, how many possible completed grids exist? For starters, look at the box in the top left corner. We know that the number of ways to arrange the numbers 1 through 4 is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 4 factorial, equals 24. Once you've chosen the order of these four numbers, say like so, there are two ways to finish the first row and two ways to finish the first column, say like so. And it can be shown that no matter how you've chosen all these numbers, there are exactly three ways to fill out the rest of the box. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to show that if you put a 1 in this spot, then there's just one way to finish. But if you put a 2 in that spot, then there are two ways to finish. Hence, there are exactly three ways, 1 plus 2 ways, to finish this puzzle. So, altogether, the number of possible 4x4 four four Shidoku grids is 24 times 2 times 2 times 3, 288 ways to finish the puzzle. So, how about 9x9 nine nine Sudoku grids? Using similar symmetry arguments and lots of brute force computing, it was shown in 2006 that there are over 6.67 sextillion possible 9x9 nine nine completed Sudoku grids. That's nearly 7 billion trillion possibilities, and it's more than 100 times as large as the number of achievable Rubik's Cube positions. And that's just the number of final answers. The number of initial grids that can lead to these answers is even larger, so there should be no shortage of puzzles anytime soon. Here's a related question. Every Sudoku puzzle is required to have a unique solution. Is it possible to be given 50 numbers and not have a unique solution? How about 60 or 70 numbers? Believe it or not, it's possible to be given 77 of the 81 numbers and still not have a unique solution. Now, how is that possible? 
Suppose I showed you this much of the puzzle. 77 of the squares have been filled. We know the missing numbers are 2 and 3, yet we don't know if they go like this, 2, 3, 3, 2, or like that, 3, 2, 2, 3. Either way, we have a valid completed grid. Here's a much trickier question that was only resolved recently. What is the smallest number of clues needed to make a Sudoku puzzle uniquely solvable? For example, with no clues, there are more than six sextillion ways to complete the Sudoku. It's easy to see that seven clues isn't enough either. Why? With seven clues, there has to be at least two missing numbers. With two missing numbers, you can't possibly have a unique solution, right? Say two and three were missing. Both of them were missing. Then for any valid solution, we could interchange all the twos with the threes and get another valid solution. That's why some hard Sudoku puzzles might have one missing number, but it will never be missing two. So the natural question becomes, what is the smallest number of clues that you can be given and still have a unique solution? There are many examples of puzzles with 17 clues that have a unique solution. Here's one of them. This puzzle has 17 clues, count them, but it only has one unique solution. In 2012, it was finally shown, using clever search strategies and lots of computer time, that there is no 16-clue puzzle that leads to a unique solution. But other questions still remain open. For example, did you ever notice that practically every crossword puzzle is rotationally symmetric? That means that if you rotate the puzzle 180 degrees, then the black squares are still in the same positions. The same is true with Sudoku. In most Sudoku puzzles found in books and magazines, it's customary for the starting clues to be placed in a rotationally symmetric way. For example, here's a Sudoku with 18 clues placed in a rotationally symmetric way. Right? If you rotated this board 180 degrees, you'd have numbers in the same spots. The 17-clue puzzle that we saw earlier is not rotationally symmetric, and so far, nobody's been able to find one, so it's still an open question if 18 clues is the minimum. Here's an 18, interesting 18-clue 18 puzzle. It appears in the book, Taking Sudoku Seriously, by mathematicians Jason Rosenhaus and Laura Talman. Not only is the puzzle rotationally symmetric, but in the spirit of rotational symmetry, the digits of this puzzle come from the first 18 digits of pi. You gotta love it. There's a three, one, four, one, five, nine, two, six. It's great, and it's rather pretty to look at. But enough talking about Sudoku, let's now learn the strategies that will allow us to solve most Sudoku puzzles quickly and easily. Now I should tell you, by the way, that I used to be pretty terrible at Sudoku until I sought advice from an expert. As luck would have it, one of my very own students, a math major at Harvey Mudd College named Palmer Mebbin, was an expert at puzzles. Actually, that's an understatement. Palmer was the 2011 United States Puzzle Champion and later that year was winner of the World Puzzle Championships. He learned his Sudoku techniques from Thomas Snyder, also known as Dr. Sudoku, who is himself a past U.S. Puzzle Champion and three-time World Sudoku Champion. I'm very grateful to Palmer and Tom for allowing me to share some of their techniques with you. After learning these techniques, you should be able to do just about any Sudoku puzzle that you come across. Dare I say, you'll find them as easy as pie. To prove my point, let's look at that pie puzzle from earlier. Okay, here it is, just 18 digits. How do we get started? Now, before I go any further, let's make sure that we define all of our terms properly. 
A Sudoku puzzle is played on a 9 by 9 grid consisting of 81 squares with some number of initial clues. It has 9 rows, 9 columns, and 9 boxes. The numbers that can potentially go in a square are called the candidates for that square. For example, in our pie puzzle, this square over here, it can't be a 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, or 9. So the candidates for that square are 3, 7, and 8. Although soon enough, we'll see why that square has to be a 3. Now, I used to go about Sudoku all wrong. I would enter the candidate numbers for each square in hopes of finding a square with a single candidate. And some books and websites actually take that approach. But I'm here to tell you that this is the wrong way to start the puzzle. You might want to do this if you get stuck near the end, but you definitely don't want to do this at the beginning of the puzzle. In fact, you want to take the opposite approach. Instead of asking for each square, which numbers can go in this square, you want to ask for each number which squares can take this number. Let me illustrate. Let's start by looking at the number that appears most in this grid. That would be the number 3, which appears, oh, four times in this grid. Next, we'll be able to place some new 3's using a process that I call tic-tac-toe. Now, every Sudoku has nine rows and nine columns, but if you focus on the thick lines, it sort of looks like a big tic-tac-toe board, right? You can think of it as having three big rows, big row one, big row two, big row three, and three big columns, one, two, and three. Now, look for a number that appears twice in the same big row or big column. Okay, so here uh, the number 3 appears twice in the second big column. That's in little column 5 and little column 6. Now let's look at the other little column. That would be column 4. And I ask you, where can the third 3 go in that little column? Now it can't go in the top box because of this 3. It can't go in the middle box because of that three, so it must go in the bottom box over in one of these spaces. But there's only one place it can go in that box, so the three must go there. So I call this tic-tac-toe. By the way, we call the number that we just entered into the puzzle a hidden single. That's a number that has only one legal square in a row, column, or box. Okay, so the only legal place that a three could go in that column was there. So that's what made it a hidden single. The best way to find hidden singles is through the tic-tac-toe process. So let's do it again. This time, notice that the big middle row has two threes in it, right, here and there. So if we focus on the other row, we do tick, tack, toe. Now hold on a second. The third three must be in one of these two open spots. But it can't be here because of the three below it. So it must go here. Now the third big column has two threes in it. So we can do tick, tack, toe again. All right, so let's see. Tick, tack, toe, we have to have a three in one of here, one of these three spots, but correction, it can't be here because of the other three. So there are only two possible locations for the three. Now listen to this because it's important. If a number has only two possible locations inside a box, then I will write that number real small inside of its two possible squares. Let me say that again for emphasis. For most of the puzzle, the only time to write a little number in the puzzle is if that number has only two places to go inside a box. Not three, not four, two places to go. 
I usually write them in pencil so they can be erased later as needed. All right, let's do another example of this. The third big row has two threes in it, right? Here and there. So tic-tac-toe gives us tic-tac-toe, but it can't go there. So it has to be one of these two spots, so we pencil them in. Now there's one more tic-tac-toe on the board, but it doesn't use threes. Do you see it? In the last big column, we have two nines. So doing tic-tac-toe with them gives us two places where the nines can go up here, right? Tic-tac-toe can't be here, so it has to be one of those two, one of those two places, all right? And we mark them like so. By the way, let me say something about pencil marks. You'll notice that I put all the threes in their upper right corner of the square. And I put all my nines in the lower right corner of the square. And if you think of a square as having nine places for numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, I'll always put my pencil mark numbers in the same place just to be consistent. Okay, now there are no more places to perform tic-tac-toe, so it's time to learn a new technique. Now with tic-tac-toe, you needed two repeated numbers in the same big row or column. When two numbers are not in the same big row and column, then we can sometimes use cross-hatching. So what's that? For example, if you cross-hatch the threes, the three in this column and the three in this row, we get that no three can appear anywhere in this box except for here. And notice how this three eliminates this three as a potential candidate, leaving us with this three here. It also eliminates this three here, so the only place for a three in this box would be here. We've now placed every three on the grid, and we won't ever have to deal with that number again. If I were doing this on paper, I might put a check mark above that three to indicate that I don't have to worry about threes anymore. Let's look for more places to cross hatch. Now, when I scan the grid with my eyes, I look for certain structures. I see the top left box has a two by two mini box. I see a completed line inside this box, and I see lots of boxes containing right angles. Here's one, there's one, there's one. All of these structures tend to be very helpful. Let's start with this angle. Now, this box will contain three unfilled squares in a row and three unfilled squares in a column which is sometimes susceptible to cross-hatching. Notice that this row has a, has, notice that this row has a five, and this column has a five, so when we cross-hatch, there's only one place the five can go, namely here in this square, creating another mini box. As soon as you fill in a new number, you should see what kind of chain reaction it causes. For instance, if we do tic-tac-toe with the fives, we get that a five must be, let's see, tic-tac-toe has to be in one of these two squares. And also, because of that five, we have tic-tac-toe has to be in one of these two squares. Ooh, that's actually good news, and I'll say more about that later. Okay, let's go for another angle, another right angle. Uh, here, we can, we can plow through the blank spaces of this box, cross-hatching with ones, right? I got a one up here and a one over there, so that means a one has to go here. Once we have a one, um, this creates a chain reaction, right? Another tic-tac-toe, tic-tac, and one of these two has to be one, okay? Oh, and, and wait a minute, let's, let's not forget that it could also cause a chain reaction here, tic-tac-toe, one of these two must be one as well. Okay, let's do one more angle, all right? So looking up here, 
Now, if I look at that 6, it plows through this column fine, but nowhere else, okay? So it, there are three places the 6 can go in that box, so we don't write anything down with that. On the other hand, the number 2 will cross hatch very nicely. You see the 2 goes to plows here, the 2 plows there, with one place for the 2 right there, okay? Next, once we get a number, we should do tic-tac-toe, tic-tac, toe, one of these two has to be a two, good, and then tic-tac-toe, well this seems to leave three places for the two. Now as it turns out, it, 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 the two can't go over there, but I haven't explained why yet, so I won't pencil anything in here. Okay, I'm done with angles, now let's explore some mini boxes, starting with this nice little mini box over here. Now with tic-tac-toe and angles, we needed two numbers to make progress. But with mini boxes, you often need just one number to make progress. Now when I plow this white space with this 8, that means we're going to have to have an 8 in one of these two squares. So I'll pencil some 8's in over there. And when I plow this white space with the 1, right, you see the 1 going all the way here, well, that's going, to force, that's going to force me to have a 1 in one of these two squares, so I'll pencil them in there. Aha! Look what happens. Notice that one of these squares has to be a 1. Thus, no other 1's can appear anywhere in that row, right? Because one of these is going to be a 1. We call this situation a pointing pair. You can think of these ones as like pointing a ray gun across its row, eliminating all other candidate ones. In particular, this one is no longer a candidate, so now there's only one one left in this box, namely this one. Okay? So, we can write it in. Um, let's look at another mini box. Okay, here I've got a nice mini box that's waiting for something to happen. Now, when we check out this column, we find a missing 4 and 6, right? 4 and 6 are not in this box. So that means that I can't have 4s or 6s anywhere here. That means that a 4 and 6 must go in here in some order. Now, I don't know which of these is the 4 and which of these is the 6, but I do know that these two squares can only contain a 4 or 6 since they can't go anywhere else. So let's write them in. We call this a hidden pair, right? We, we saw, so these two numbers have to be 4 and 6 in some order. No other number uh, would be allowed in there. We saw another hidden pair earlier over here. You see the 5, 9 and the 5, 9? Since these two numbers, since 5 can only go in these two places and 9 can only go in these two places, then they must contain these numbers, 5 and 9, in some order. Okay, let's pause, catch our breath here, and let me ask you, what six numbers must occupy these six squares? Okay? Say your answer. I want you to give me the answer in increasing order. What are the six numbers in these squares? 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 9. Okay? So, what numbers are missing from here? Say the answer in increasing order. The missing numbers are 1, 5, 7. That means that the numbers in these three squares must be 1, 5, and 7 in some order. Now the 1 can't go here because of that 1, and the 1 can't go here. Why can't the 1 go here? Because of that pointing pair of 1's. It's firing its ray gun at it. So the only legal place for the 1 in this box is here. The other numbers must be 5 and 7 in some order. But because of the 5 here, we're going to have to have uh, the 5 and 7 here and there. Okay? And uh, this 5, by the way, forces us to have, have a 5 and a 9. We weren't sure what their order was before, but we know now that these must be 9 and 5 uh, to fit over there. Great. 
Now let's see. What, what else do I know? Let's look at the, um, let's look at the fourth column here, this, this column here. We have seven of our nine numbers. It's only missing which two numbers? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we're missing eight and nine. And, they, and because there's a nine there, those eight and nine are going to have to go like that. This opens up the puzzle considerably, and the next few steps of the puzzle are pretty easy. Okay, let's see. Uh, now that we got the 8 and the 9, let's do some tic-tac-toe, right? We have 8, 9 here, 8, 9 here. I'm going to have to have 8, 9 here, exactly, and because of the 9, they have to be 8 and 9 like that. Um, that leaves for us in this box the remaining three numbers, right? We've got 2, 3, 5, 6, 8, 9 in this box. So the missing three numbers are 1, 4, and 7. Now, the one, because of this one, one of the ones has to go here. We don't know which one. And then the four and seven are somewhere else. But check this out. We call this situation a pointing triple. One, four, and seven, because they're here in some order, they can't be anywhere else in this column. This eliminates all other ones, fours, and sevens as candidates for this column. Okay, so if I eliminate 1s, 4s, and 7s from here, I see that this can't be a 1, so a 1 must go there. And this can't be a 4, so the 4 must be there. We call that, by the way, a foregone conclusion. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, that forces the last square up here to be a 6. And what's left? Well, looking at this, looking at this middle column, uh, the only two numbers left in this column have to be 6 and 7 in some order. I'll just write pencil in the 6 and 7 in both places. Now let's examine the remaining two squares over here. They must contain 2 and 5 in some order. But because of this 5, this square here can't be a 5, so it can only be a 2, okay? Just like that. So a square that can only take on one value, like a 2 here, is called a naked single. And they become more common as our rows, columns, and boxes start to fill up. Naturally, the other missing number here must be 5. That 5 sets off another chain reaction. We must have a 5 here, right? Tick, tack, toe puts a 5 over here, eliminating the 5 below, so forcing us to have a 5 over there. Okay, I, I might put a check mark above my 5 because now the 5s are, are finished. Let's look for another naked single. In the top row, we're missing the digits 8 and 9. But this square can't be a 9, right, because of that 9 down there, so it must be an 8, forcing the 9 to go here, and because now we're left with one place for the 8, the 8 would have to go there. That forces the other numbers in this row to be 4 and 6 in some order, and that leads to another hidden pair, right? This is 2, 7, and 2, 7 in some order. Now what? We still haven't explained. There's still parts of our puzzle we haven't explained yet. Let's look at this mini box down over here. Okay, so when I look at this mini box, this two clears out that row, and that gives us a nice pointing pair of twos down below. Now, with this pointing pair of twos, it fires its ray gun, forcing, notice it's going to eliminate that two, forcing us to have a seven here and a 2 there. What next? Well, let's see. We have a bunch of 9s on the board. In fact, we have 7 9s on the board. Maybe we can finish them off. Okay, so with our 9s, we do tick, tack, toe. Can't be there, so it must be there. And 1 to go. Once you have 8 numbers, you're, the ninth is forced. Tick, tack, toe has to be there. Although we've completed more than half the puzzle, some challenges still remain. 
That's part of what makes Sudoku so addictive, by the way. As you figure out more and more numbers, you feel as if the puzzle should get easier. But that's not always the case. It may be that you've only reached the low-hanging fruit, and the remaining numbers might require a ladder. Now, at some point, tic-tac-toe stops working, and there may not be any crosshatches that jump out at you. The question is, what do you do when you get stuck? Here are my suggestions. Suggestion number one, walk away and come back to it later. After taking a break, you'll often see things that you missed before. Examine the numbers that are almost finished. But if you're still stuck, let's try these techniques. Scrutinize your rows, columns, and boxes that are almost finished and look for naked singles. Don't forget chain reactions. Anytime you get a new piece of information, see what, that, what chain reaction that causes. Or finally, you could use the advanced tools that we'll talk about later in this lecture. Okay, in this puzzle, we finished off numbers 3, 5, and 9. What's the next best candidate? Well, let's see. We've actually solved six of the ones here. And, and when I look at the penciled in ones, we see that two of the boxes have hidden pairs. There's a hidden pair of ones here and a hidden pair of ones there. So there's only one box where we haven't said anything about ones. So let's take a look at that box. Now, when I crosshatch my ones in that box, I go here and there. That leaves a pair of ones possibly over here. But that's a pointing pair, right? Those two ones are going to eliminate the one from this box, forcing a one to go over there. And once I have a one over here, then the remaining two boxes here are four and seven in some order, OK? Anything left with the ones? I have a pair of ones here, a pair of ones there. They form like a little rectangle. There's nothing I can do with those right now, so I'm going to leave them alone. Let's try another number. Let's say two. All right, so let's take a look. We got two, two, two. Let's take a look at this box. Now, when I crosshatch my twos, two and two. Oh, that's nice. There's only one place for the two over here, OK? And this sets off a nice chain reaction. We've got tick, tack, toe, tick, tack, oh, toe, right? We cross out this two. We're left with one over here. And now the twos are history. OK, we, we've now dealt with our ones, twos, and threes. Let's look at the fours. Um, I think there's not much that happens with the fours. All I can say is in this box, then because of that four, I know that I have to have, have a pair of fours in here so I can pencil that in. Uh, how about the sixes? There's nothing obvious that happens with the sixes, so let's move on to the sevens. Okay, so seven, seven, seven. Uh, wait, wait a second. I see something interesting here. This seven in this column, looking at, look, focusing on this box, gives me a pointing pair of sevens after I go through here and I crosshatch the seven there, that leads to a pointing pair of sevens down there. And now I can do tic-tac-toe, right? With tic-tac, because this gives us the column, toe gives me a seven right over there. Great. OK, and let's see, does that give me anything else? That seven, what reaction does that cause? Uh, crosshatching there. I have to have a seven in one of these two boxes, so I'll pencil those in. OK, finally, let's see what eights give us. In this box here, uh, there's a, two places the eights can go here or there, so we'll pencil that in. And in this box, let's see, there are two places for eights to go there, so I'll pencil those in. That's nice. And now let's look at this box. Let's see, eights over here and here. Oh, this is good. I'm going to put, I've got a pair of eights that can go here. Now let's pause for a moment. Uh, in this box, we can only have, uh, a one can only go in these two places. An eight can only go in these two places. Even though a seven would like to be considered for that place, there's no room for the seven here, right? These, these ones and eights are claiming those two. So that means the seven can't go here and it must go there. Uh, this tells us, by the way, looking over here, that the four seven has to be 
4, and 7 in that order. And the number missing from this row, uh, because I know this is 1 and 8 in some order, and I've got 2, 6, 9, 7, 3, and 5, this has to be a 4. And now the rest is easy. You might say that the puzzle practically solves itself. And there we have it. We're done. We just finished a puzzle that had only 18 clues using rather simple techniques. Let's recap. In this puzzle, we were able to fill in most of our numbers by judicious use of tic-tac-toe and cross-hatching. These would often lead to hidden singles, numbers that could only find one place to go in a row, column, or box. When a number could only find two possible squares in a box, we would lightly pencil in that number in both places. If both of those places were in the same row or column, that's called a pointing pair. And that can sometimes eliminate candidates from the other boxes. And if you find two numbers that can only go in the same two spots in a box, then they form a hidden pair. And those spots must contain those numbers. We started our puzzle by looking for numbers that appear a lot, since they tend to produce most useful tic-tac-toes, right angles, and mini boxes, and since they tend to produce very useful crosshatches. There was one other structure that I mentioned, but we never got to exploit it. It's called a completed line. A completed line consists of three numbers that completely fill a row or column of a box, like in this example. Completed lines let you start a tic-tac-toe with one number instead of two. Look outside the box, think outside the box, and look for, look for numbers that, that are in the other two columns. Now look for any numbers that are not in the box below. So for instance here, I see eights and nines in the other two columns that aren't in the box that contains the completed line. The number eight forces us to have one of these two squares below as an eight giving us a pointing pair of eights in the bottom box. And this, and this forces a pair of eights in one of the middle box squares. The nine helps us even more. So this nine in the top box forces this nine in the bottom box, giving us this nine in the middle box, giving us our nines and subsequently our eights. When starting a Sudoku puzzle, the first thing I look for are completed lines. Here's a puzzle created by Thomas Snyder. I like Tom's puzzles because they tend to have an artistic quality about them or some hidden joke beneath the surface. He created this puzzle for the Silicon Valley Puzzle Fest. If you look closely, you'll see that most of the clues combine to create SI, the chemical abbreviation for the element silicon. Even the extraneous clues have some meaning since silicon is the 14th element of the periodic table and has atomic weight 28. I'll let you have the fun of solving this puzzle yourself, but the key to solving it is to exploit the three completed lines here. Using the techniques that we know, you can solve most, but not all, of the puzzles that you'll find in newspapers and magazines. But to solve the most difficult Sudoku puzzles, typically labeled as tough, fiendish, or diabolical, we might need a few more tools in our toolbox. I'll now share with you some of my favorite techniques. But to use them, we sometimes need more information than we've written in our puzzle. The method I've been teaching you focuses on numbers that can only go in a small number of squares. When you've reached a position where you're really stuck and you can't make any more progress through tic-tac-toe, cross-hatching, hidden pairs, and naked singles, then it's time to reverse that approach and look for squares that can only take a few numbers. In other words, now, and only now, it may be time to pencil in the candidates for each square. Be especially on the lookout for squares that can only take two numbers. The first thing to look for are what's called naked pairs. A naked pair consists of two squares in the same row, column, or box that can only take the same two numbers. 
Let's start with an abstract example, then a real one. Here, the squares indicated in this grid cannot be 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, or 8. They can only be 7 or 9. So since we have two squares that can only accept 7 or 9, those squares must be 7 or 9 in some order. That now gives us a pointing pair, which can be used to figure out other squares. For instance, so the 7 in this column has to go there. Here's a real-life example. We've solved most of the puzzle, but now we're stuck. Try as we may, we can't make any more progress using our current techniques. Really, you just have, to use, you just have two options here. Either fill in the rest of the pencil marks or take a wild guess. I'll say more about the guessing strategy later, but let's fill in the pencil marks now. Notice, by the way, that there are only 13 squares that need new pencil marks. That's way less than going through every square at the start. Look at the squares that can only take two values. Most of them are pointing pairs that we've looked at before, but some have not yet been exploited. Do you see the naked pair? It'll use one of these two, one of these squares. Hint, it's in this row. Here they are. These two squares can only be 6 or 9. As a result, no other 6s or 9s can appear in that row, so we can remove them as candidates. So we erase this 6 and this 6 and this 9, leaving us with a naked single. Now that we know that this square must be 7, this causes a pretty big chain reaction that solves the rest of the puzzle. There's an extension of the naked pair concept called naked triples. A naked triple consists of three squares in the same row, column, or box that can only take on three values. For example, if these three squares can only take on the values 1, 2, or 3, then nothing else in that row can have 1, 2, or 3. In fact, we can reach the same conclusion even if the situation were like this. It's still the case that these three squares can only take the values 1, 2, and 3. In fact, even this situation is a naked triple where we have three squares that can take on the values 1, 2, 1, 3, or 2, 3. It's still the case that no other 1s, 2s, or 3s can go in that row. Here's another neat idea known as X-Wing. It goes like this. Suppose the, suppose the number 5, say, only has two places it can go in column A, say here and there. And suppose that in column B, 5 can only go in the same two rows, like here. The X-wing rule says that there can't be any 5s in any of these locations. That's pretty cool and powerful. Why is that? The reason is, is that if the 5 in column A goes here, then it can't go here. So the only place left in column B is here. In other words, if this is a 5, then so is this. On the other hand, by the same reasoning, if the 5 in column A goes here, then the 5 in column B must go there. You see where the name X-Wing comes from? Looking at this big X, we're guaranteed to have a pair of fives on the corners of this rectangle, so fives can't go anywhere else in these rows. X-wings can be pretty ticky, tricky to spot, but when you find them, they tend to simplify the puzzle quite a bit. Now let me show you my favorite advanced solving technique. It's called Unique Rectangle. It's based on the fact that every Sudoku is required to have a unique solution. This way, the newspaper or book with the Sudoku can print the one solution to the puzzle instead of showing many possibilities. Another reason the solution has to be unique is because otherwise a solution would require you to do some guessing and all Sudokus are supposed to be solvable without requiring any guessing. When solving the Sudoku, you can sometimes exploit uniqueness. 
Let me start by showing you an illegal Sudoku situation. Here we have a situation where there are four squares that form a rectangle in the same big column that can only take on the same two values, here, seven and eight. We call this a forbidden rectangle. Now, what makes this illegal? Similar to the X-wing situation, there are exactly two possibilities. If this number is seven, then that forces our rectangle to look like this. Whereas if this number were eight, our rectangle would look like this. The trouble is that these two scenarios are perfectly interchangeable. If there's a legal way to finish this Sudoku, then there'd have to be a legal solution using that rectangle. Either way, every row, column, and box will have a seven and eight, and nothing else will be disturbed. Do you see that? For instance, if this were a legal solution, then if we interchange the two sevens and the two eights, then this would also be a legal solution. So how do we exploit this situation? Suppose when solving a Sudoku, the candidates for these four squares look like this. And again, I have to emphasize those four squares we're looking at are all in the same big column. Three of the four squares have candidates seven and eight, while the fourth square of the rectangle can be seven, eight, or nine. I claim that the fourth square has to be nine. Why? If the fourth square is not nine, then all four squares would have candidates seven and eight giving us a forbidden rectangle, and this would prevent us from having a unique solution. Now, strictly speaking, all Sudoku puzzles are supposed to be solvable by pure logic, and no guessing is required. On the other hand, if you filled up most of the puzzle and you reach a point where you get stuck, then I sometimes find it easier to try a quick guess and see what happens. I'll typically choose a square that has two possible values and that will cause a big chain reaction. When I do this, I'll circle my guess and put everything else maybe in colored pencil. Typically, one of two things will happen. Either the chain reaction will lead to a solution to the puzzle, in which case you're happy, or it will lead to some kind of logical contradiction, like a row that must have two fives in it, in which case you know that your initial assumption was wrong. Mathematicians, by the way, call this proof by contradiction. Either way, you're happy. You've either solved the puzzle or at least you've made progress. Here's another puzzle from No Frills Sudoku. It's one of the last puzzles in the book and it's given a four star rating for difficulty. Starting with these 18 clues and using the techniques we've learned, I reached this situation before getting stuck. Even after adding pencil marks, I didn't see any way, uh, any naked pairs or triples that help us, nor do I see any X-wings or unique rectangles. So now might be a good time to try a guess. Just about any square with two values should cause a pretty big chain reaction here. Let's look at this square in the middle of the puzzle. It can be a five or it can be an eight. And it's not innately obvious which number it should be. As you can verify for yourself, if you guess the number eight, then you reach a contradiction. Consequently, the number in this box has to be five. And if you put five in that square, that leads to a pretty quick solution of the rest of the puzzle. By the way, there are many variations on the Sudoku puzzle, and many of the techniques that we've learned in this lecture will transfer over. My favorite Sudoku variation is Ken Ken, which combines the logic of Sudoku with some actual reasoning about numbers as well. Similar to Sudoku, every row and column must contain the numbers one through six, and each cage indicates what the numbers add, subtract, multiply, or divide to. Numbers can be repeated in the same cage, but not in the same row or column. Puzzles like Sudoku and Ken Ken are fun because they rely entirely on logic. 
In our final lectures, we turn our attention back to games that involve only pure logic and strategy, beginning with perhaps the most famous game of all time.